bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, let us just bow our heads in prayer. Eternal and heavenly Father, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for who you are. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The conquering lion of a tribe of Judah. You reign in the affair of men. And we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have given unto us. A day in which we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God that go before and prepare the way for your people. And so today, O oh Father, as we gather together at this convention, we pray, O oh Father, that your divine purpose, your divine plan, your divine mandate will be established and manifest among us, Lord. Lord, we pray, O oh Father, that you will touch, Lord, the speaker in a very special way. That the word that comes from his mouth, O oh Father, will come from your throne. And that your will will be accomplished today, O oh Father. Father, we thank you for the praise team. Lord, we pray that the angel of heaven will sing as they sung the song, O oh Father, that you will give to them, Lord. That the song will be the song of praise and the heavens will be open oh father lord we pray oh father that wherever the persons are watching at this time oh father that you will touch that you will heal that you will deliver oh father father we pray oh god that you will have your way among us today lord in a way that we have never seen done before oh god lord we pray oh god that you will elevate that you will transform and that you will make a difference at this convention Lord, that wherever your people are watching right now, Lord, that you will move upon every heart right now, Lord, in their home, Lord God. I pray, O oh Father, that as you move upon their heart, that you will transform and conform, that they will be the people that you have chosen them to be, O oh Father. A people of righteousness, a people of holiness, O oh Father. A people, O oh God, will cry out, O oh God, and say, God, let your will be done and let your name be glorified. Lord God Almighty, oh yes, Lord, we just continue to praise you. We continue to lift you up and we continue to magnify you for your greatness and for your supremeness. So, Lord, we just say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this convention and thank you, thank you for each one that you have allowed to participate in this convention. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's a great morning for me to be standing here. I just want to thank our brother Basil for um, opening a prayer for us. And my name is Richard Thompson. I'm chairman of the Easter Convention Committee. On behalf of the committee, I want to welcome you all to our virtual National Easter Convention 2022. Yes, 2021 went so fast. But guess what? God has been good to us. He has allowed us to bring this convention to you. I want to welcome all those who are from overseas, watching those from all across Jamaica, from northern, central, eastern, western region. You know the regions you are in. Um, it's good to have you. Good to have you engaged. And, you know, we hope that you will be thoroughly blessed by the program we have for you today. I want to welcome our brother John Fraser, who will be our presenter this morning. And as you might have been aware, and I'm just confirming, that the theme is truth, our anchor. You need to believe it. And I hope you believe it. And we need to just hold on to that faith this morning. Guess what? We're having a break in our bread this morning. Yes, break in our bread. Um, based on our theme, we thought it appropriate that we could include breaking the bread this morning. Unusual, but guess what? It's all fellowship on a virtual basis. So get your wine, your juice, whatever you want to use, your biscuit, or your bread. Uh, just get it and wait for the time to come. And just be totally engaged. Yes, we want you to be eating that bread this morning. Once you be drinking that cup this morning. Want you to be engaged this morning in everything that's going to be happening. This convention costs money. We need you to be helping us. Those brown envelopes you're familiar with, get them into us. 
pack them with funds, send them in, find some way, put it on our screen, our bank account number, and you can easily send us funds right from your, your comfort zone, from your phone, from your laptop. So folks, yeah, it takes money for us to do a production like this. Yes, they say it takes money to care, but it takes money to make the kingdom grow. I would just encourage you um, to just, just contribute. Then, don't forget to our children's convention at 2 p.m. later on. Yes, get your children all engaged, get them involved, and please, you can sit and watch it with them too. I would just invite you to be blessed, and yes, just be engaged today. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. And it's such a pleasure to be here to worship the Lord with the people of God all around the convention. We want to lift up Jesus in this moment. He is the truth indeed. And in fact, we want to share this song. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. Sing along with us. I put my hope in your holy word. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. His name is Jesus. I put my hope in the word of God. Hallelujah. And indeed, as we bless him, we recognize that he is God and Lord. There is no one like our God. He's the heavenly father, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. As we prepare our hearts to, to worship at the table and to receive the communion, we want to glorify the king of kings. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty word. Sing it again. Let's sing it again. Sing. Father in heaven, how 
Father, we love you. We lift your name. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty words, blessed be the Lord God Almighty.
praise us. Praise him. Thank you, praise team. Good morning, brothers and sisters. And as we continue to fellowship with God in this manner, I invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, just to turn with me to St. John chapter 8, and I'm going to read two verses there. Verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, uh, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As we examine God's word, as we examine our own lives, our theme for this conference, and this morning in particular, truth, our anchor. There is no one else, nor nothing else, that we can be anchored to, but to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And we can only do this when we have come into this relationship, this fellowship with him, and we are anchored in his truth. In this fellowship, this morning, this method of worship, as we worship our Lord and our Savior, he made that supreme sacrifice for us. Jesus Christ, who is our truth. He went to Calvary, not for his sake, but our sake. His body was marred beyond recognition. Those stripes he received in his body was for our sakes. His blood was shed at Calvary. And as we have been reflecting over this Easter period, this time of Lent, of the sacrifice that our Lord has made for each one of us, the word reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And because he went to Calvary, his blood was shed. The sword was pierced in his body, and his blood flew. And because of that, we come into a relationship, and that blood washes us from all sin, from all unrighteousness. And this morning, as we partake of his body, this bread that represents his body, and as the word reminds us, in Isaiah, it tells us that he was marred beyond recognition. He stood on that cross for each one of us. And his body bore those stripes. And the word reminds us that by those stripes we are healed. So as we partake, as we fellowship in this manner, Jesus, before he went into that final stage here on earth, he met with his disciples in that upper room. And he broke bread with them. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And because we have accepted him as our own personal Lord and Savior, we do this not as a ritual, but as we remember and fellowship with him in an act of obedience to God and his word. And that's a part of following and walking in his truth that is our anchor. I invite you, wherever you are, we may be far away, 
but we are one in Christ. And at this time, I invite you, if you have your bread and if you have your wine, and as the disciples, as they met after Jesus returned and left, as they met one by one, host to host, the word reminds us that they broke bread. They fellowshiped. And in this manner, we will fellowship this morning. He took the bread, which represents his body, and we will partake of it. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made, your body broken for each one of us. And as we partake of it this morning, we ask your blessings upon it. We ask, O oh God, that you will strengthen us, that you will help us to recognize and to walk worthy of the vocation for which we have been called because of the sacrifice that you have made. Bless it, O oh Lord, as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And as we drink of this wine, representing his blood that was shed for each one of us, Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you bless this cup, bless this wine representing you, O oh God, your shed blood at Calvary. We thank you for your cleansing. We thank you for your washing. Bless it, O oh God, as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you, and we pray that as we continue to fellowship in this manner, that our Lord, our God, will continue to bless us as we fellowship one with another and with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, well, what a wonderful time of fellowship. As we broke bread and remembered the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And as we continue in this act of worship, we just want you to join with us as we sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Through the fiercest drought and storm, what hearts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on Fullness of God in helpless pain This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Just love of Christ. 
guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first try to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pull me from his hand till he returns. Behold, here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from His hand. Till He returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. My father sent me here to a virgin's womb, an intimate process of the master architect by his hands I was personally grown. On the night of my birth, three kings brought gifts to my home, and the brightest star in the sky is known as my birthstone. See, I was born to be great, a bright future with a dark fate. I am the light of the world, I am love, but the dark hearts of men harbor hate. And the church and state, they sent their soldiers to come get me. See, I was betrayed by the same people sitting at the table with me. Haters, you know what they say, they come a dime a dozen. There's a real popular picture out there with me having dinner with a dozen of them. I love Peter like he was my own cousin. And I told Peter that night, Peter, you will deny me before the cock crows thrice. See, the next thing I know, that chicken must have crowed. Roman soldiers are over my shoulder. Let's get the show on the road. One disciple jumped up and cut a soldier's ear off. Down to the wax. No more, one more miracle before I leave. Let me put this man's ear back. Now they got my hands tied up. It's suppressed and subdued. And I'm thinking to myself, man, how rude are this dude? I'm the same one that fed 5,000, a multitude. Two fish, five loaves. I am the original hoe. And I don't need Don Perrion, Cristal, or Moet to shine. See, my daddy makes it rain. I turn the waters into wine. And you stand here with your soldiers with ill intent. I could have called on 12 legions of angels to deliver me from this nonsense, but yet, not my will, but yes, God, your will. And on that note, let his will be fulfilled. Let these men go. See, I'm the one you want to kill. Could have stopped you with one of my one-liners like, peace be still but I'm the Prince of Peace and I'll be the Prince of Peace forevermore see this is my walk this is what I came here for even though Satan couldn't stop me with temptation I passed all of his tests I'm not enslaved by the limitations of the flesh a fisher of men tell the fishermen to cast their nets the deeper the water gets the deeper the odds the deeper your relationship with God and my relationship is deep it's as deep as my faith which is deeper than your hate deeper than any crown of thorns could ever penetrate and if you need an example of deep here I'll demonstrate see I walked on water I withered the fig tree I told the mountains be taken up and cast into the sea I can calm the storms nothing's impossible when I pray I command the winds and the waters and even they obey another day at the office God's business and I take the family business serious on my off days I cast out demons and unclean spirits I am the great I am the Lamb of God bright and morning star and the Mr. Mag I am the wonderful counselor, divine advocate. Go and ask Lazarus. I am the resurrection, the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, I'm the one they crucified. But he who lives and believes in me will never die. See, that's God's promise. And I am the guarantor. See, this is my walk. This is what I came here for. So continue with your sticks and stones. Continue with your lashes. We triumph, we overcome, we arise from the ashes. I heal the deaf, I heal the sick, I heal the mute, I heal blindness. And if you kill me with your hate, I will kill you with kindness. You're looking at heaven's finest, Emmanuel, the rock, the Alpha and Omega. And this is why I'm hot. And I carried my cross to Calvary for the world and its sins. 
Tell Mary not to weep. This is not how the story ends. Tell Mary not to weep. Tell Martha not to moan. In three days, roll back the stone. I'm gone. At this, our national Easter convention, dear Lord, as we come before you in prayer, it is indeed a great privilege, Lord, to approach you in the appointed way that you have set aside, and that is through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we invite everyone here to be bowed in your holy presence as we pray together. Jamaica land we love, Lord, is in elements of great turmoil. We have indeed been beleaguered by every form of evil. Crime is escalating. Murder has allowed blood to soak our land. Lord, there is incest. Lord, there is adultery. Lord, there is bribe and graft and so many forms of evil. Our schools, Lord, have been engulfed by acts of unbelief. The underbelly of sin have taken over our secondary institutions. And how we lament, dear God, the sweep and the curse of necromancy, the use of guard rings in schools, among other evil traits. And so, Father, what more appropriate time is it than now that our nation should bow the knee and come to you this day, asking for your forgiveness and your cleansing from all our unrighteous acts. Indeed, Lord, we have done every form of imaginable evil. And we think, Lord, that your ear is not too far and your mind is with us, O oh God, as we come in repentance to you. Dear Father, we ask first of all that you will bless this convention, that you will bless the speaker who will address us this day, that you will bless those people who would sing, and that your word of salvation would go out among the parishes among the communities, among the small districts and the nooks of, and cranny of Jamaica, and that your word of salvation might permeate this land, Jamaica land we love, as the waters cover the sea. Lord, we lift before you our national leaders, the office of Governor General, the office of Prime Minister, the office of the leader of the opposition, the parliament and the senate. We can see each of those members in our mind's eye this day. And we want to commit, to you, commit them to you lovingly, dear God and Father. We want to commit the decisions they take, even the discourse which will emanate in those national decisions. May they be for the good of Jamaica and its development. Lord, we commit them to you in a special way that your salvation would sweep the shores of our parliament and the Senate as well. We commit the families of these persons to you in very specific ways. Lord, we present the resources of our country to you Lord, we have recognized that you have caused a limit to be put on bauxite mining in reserve areas. And we thank you that this limit has been approved by the government of Jamaica. 
Lord, we commit our fishing resource and we know that there's a close season for harvesting conch and other uh, aquatic life. And Lord, we ask that you will bless those resources. Lord, we bless, we ask that you will bless our entertainers who have spread the flag and the banner of Jamaica far and wide globally. Bless what they would say and anoint it to be words of, of upliftment both locally and overseas. Father, we commit our teachers and the entire teaching profession to you. May you inspire them with words of wisdom. May you inspire them with ways of inoculating our country and our youngsters with great values and pleasant and acceptable attitudes as they interact among each other. Lord, we recognize that the plague of COVID-19 you have sought to lift, Lord. And we recognize that it's not so much the protocols that we have followed, Lord, but because we have beseeched you in prayer relentlessly. And now it's a time to acknowledge your goodness and your grace, not just to Jamaica, but to other lands. Lord, we come today with thanksgiving on behalf of this dear country of ours. Many of us born here, it's a land out of many which we are one as united by you alone. So Lord, we ask that you would bless the prayers of each heart today and cause that our prayers will be fulfilled in your time and in your own way, in your own special way, as we pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior and soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. What a beautiful day it is, my brothers and sisters, to worship the Lord. The song we're going to share with you this morning, The Anchor Holds. And to know we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, one indeed that is firm and secured in the Lord Jesus.
long ties linked and the cables strain with your anchor shift or firm remain singing we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll fastened to the rock which cannot move Grounded firm and deep In the Savior's love It is safely moved To the storm we stand For it is well secured By the Savior's hand And the cave Keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the beetles roll fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love, with your eyes behold. of gold and the harbor bright with your anchor safe by the heavy shore when the storms are last forevermore sing it we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure Which cannot move Grounded firm and deep In the Savior's love Anchor holds Oh, the ship is battered
Malcolm John Fraser is a commended full-time Bible teacher, spiritual director, and conference speaker. Brother Fraser hails from the community of Hinestown, St. Anne. He attended Sunday school at Good Tidings Gospel Chapel and eventually surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus while still in high school. He is a graduate of Midland Bible Institute, Carver Bible College, and Capital Bible Seminary. John is a founder and director of the Disciples Bible Class and Back to the Basics and is a well sought after Bible teacher among the assemblies of the Christian Brethren. John, his wife Wendy, and their son live in Brooklyn, New York. The Fraser family shares membership at the Hillcrest Gospel Chapel, Fresh Meadows, New York City. Please welcome Brother John Fraser as he joins us from New York. Good morning, good morning, good morning to the brothers and sisters as we gather here at this historic occasion again one more time at our uh, National Easter Convention. And it's a real joy and honor to be asked to bring today's message from the Lord. Um, it is with a sense of gratitude um, that we, my wife and I, accept this uh, invitation and opportunity to uh, minister. And especially with the topic at hand, we are truly grateful. And we pray that having share in our breaking of bread just just before uh, that we are ready to hear some more about the truth uh, con concerning the lord jesus christ we are here to, to talk today about the uh, truth or anchor and uh, we uh, crave your prayers we pray that we not only be able to have a delivery of the message but uh, that our hearts will uh, incline be inclined towards the word of god we are going to be reading some verses here today, and then we are going to launch out into an exposition and try to get a better understanding or a moment of uh, affirmation and to remind ourselves of the, the word of God and the importance as it relates to our ministry and our personal lives. We're going to begin from the Old Testament. You know, the Bible does have a lot to say about the truth. In fact, if the Bible were silent on truth, we would not have any. Uh, that is the basis of truth. It's the source of the Bible, the inspired word of God. Exodus 34 and verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Isaiah 43 and verse 9, Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us farmer things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Daniel 9, 13, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayers before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Malachi 2.6, the law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned away, and turned many away from iniquity. New Testament, Matthew twenty two sixteen, 16. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. John 1, 14, well known from Sunday school days. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And they sent to him, John 8, 32, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians and the teacher. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, 
and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Galatians 3 and verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We stop there and trust that God would honor his word and in the process you bless our hearts for his name's sake. I'm going to share with you three images on the monitor. And I know there are a lot of things that are consistent and common about these three images, but I'm looking for one that reflects something about our theme. Truth, our anchor. I want us to just observe that the three pictures you're looking at, they all have an anchor. They dare not, not only for safety reason, but according to maritime laws, they dare not sail the ocean without an anchor. Not only that they must have an anchor, but I want you to observe this. The anchors are placed on these crafts at a visible location. They can be easily seen. In a crisis, you shouldn't have to go down deep down into the deck to find it. You shouldn't have to be searching, did we bring it? It is required by a law that the anchors be in such a place uh, that those who monitor the transportation and movement of these crafts, that they understand that they have an anchor. And the anchor must not only be, be visible, but it must be accessible. Because you don't know when, you have no control of when, wind, and when things that threaten the safety of individuals and your hardware will come about. For us in the spiritual world, we know that is the culture. That's the nature of our ministry. We are called upon to deal with the enemy. We are called upon to model truth and to make truth, yes, to make truth our anchor. We are called with a ministry to declare truth, to believe truth, and to behave truth. This is perhaps the only ministry in the world, the only institution in the world that could not survive without truth. And not just any truth, but a particular type of truth. Not the truth discovered by men or philosophers, not the truth that the so-called philosophers of the world and the social engineers would put together to see how they can influence and how they could manage society. That's not the type of truth we are talking about. We are not talking about psychological, philosophical truth or political truth, perhaps called political science. What then is truth? And I just want to remind us whenever we are discussing any subject or any topic that has anything to do with the nature of God or the attributes of God, we have to handle that with care. We're thinking about love, especially when it's not Valentine's and we are asked to address love in the church in the context of the Bible, Christianity, what is love and, and so forth. We have to always remind ourselves as a Bible teacher that the Bible declares that God is love, that love is an attribute of God. So our definitions then and our description has to be consistent with what is revealed in scripture. That's what we're talking about. 
So let us try to handle truth in that context and in, in the same approach. Be careful because truth is an attribute of God. So let's see what uh, we can glean from this. First, truth is an attribute of God. It's the nature of God. It is not that God possesses truth. It's not that God is truthful in his testimony and in his work. It is a fact that God is the quintessence of truth. He's the personification of truth. He doesn't acquire it. By definition, he is truth. Everything about him is consistent with the nature of truth. We're talking about integrity. We're talking about the, the core of God being is that he is consistently truthful. Truth dwells in him. He doesn't acquire it. He doesn't seek after it. He is truth. And that is where we can understand when we talk about the immutability of God. See, truth doesn't change. It does not change. Truth impacts everything and everyone it comes in contact with. But truth itself is beyond mutability. There is no mutation in truth. God is the personification of truth. We hear the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. There's no other way. Other religions of the world have embraced error, different versions and intensity of it. But the truth is only through the Son of God can anyone access the God the Father. And so he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And apart from him, there is, there is absolutely no truth. Truth then is an attribute of God. We are anchored to God. We are anchored to a God who doesn't change. A God who lives and exists in the dynamics of eternity. There's no variation nor duration with him as we as creatures of time experience. God is eternal. And since he is truth, and since there's no discovery of any truth outside of himself, God doesn't need to make any adjustment to himself, to his conduct, to his plan. Because God, unlike us, we discover truth. God doesn't discover truth. He is truth. Not only that truth is an attribute of God, but truth is the word of God. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We need not search anywhere else outside of the Bible to find truth. We search the scriptures because in them we know we have the embodiment of divine truth. It's always important that we, when we are studying the Bible, remember that the Bible constitutes a book with dual authorship. We're going to look at that in a moment. It's okay to identify the human author and to understand who wrote this and so forth. In the early days of the church, when they were setting up the canonicity of the Bible as to what books should be in them, especially the Old Testament, the New Testament books. And if you remember that the book of Hebrews came out of some special scrutiny. Books that don't have any author, human author linked to them. And until this day, we really don't know who is the human author of the book of Hebrews. But we know this. It carries the signature on the foot and the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. It has the nature of truth in it. It synchronizes with all the other truths in scripture and every subject that the book of Hebrew touches is attached to truth revealed in the scriptures. And that is very important for us to, to remember. We are told then in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That has been our legacy as brethren. It has been a part of our heritage. 
part of our history, that we are men who are searching the truth and search the scripture. And in them, we spend a lot of time. We have our tools. We have the strong concordance that we would use. We have the W.E. Vines of words of the Bible. We know we have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament words that help us to understand, reveal truth. So even though we may not know the human author, we can detect the footprints and fingerprints of God, the Holy Spirit, as Peter is going to tell us in a moment. So we ought to be diligent then too. And, and I love this verse because we have to remember this, that as ministers of the gospel, in dividing the word of God, in proclaiming the word of God, there is no room here for creativity and innovation. We have to rightly handle the word of God. The idea there, the, the imagery in um, rightly dividing is that of a carpenter who cuts a piece of wood according to the line. He cuts straight on the line. He doesn't waver and go to the left nor the right, but he's a straight shooter, a straight cutter. That's the idea, rightly dividing the word of truth. When the Bible addresses anything, we know it's a closed discussion. It's not open up to human ideas and concepts or to what you think or what I think. A minister who is rightly dividing the word of truth will soon discover that he doesn't need polling now pollsters to assist him. He's not interested in what most people think about the verse. He wants to know what thus says the Lord. And we cannot succumb to the knocking on the doors for us to respond to popular demand and to what most people are doing. How to compare ourselves with others. We are conditioned, we are limited, we are governed by truth. That's our anchor. And we can't waver when it comes to biblical truth. What is truth? Truth is a standard of me measurement. It must be objective, it must be consistent. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The spirit of God indeed take no chance in putting any words between the request to sanctify them by your truth and quickly gives us the location, the definition, the reference to your word. Your word is truth. Now, I want you to pay close attention to something here that we could easily think could be said another way. There are people, Christians, who believe that the Bible carries the word of God. It possesses the word of God. And it sounds good that if you're not careful, you say a quick amen without thinking about it. But it is not true. It's not accurate that the Bible carries the word of truth. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is. Thy word is truth. It's not thy word contains truth. And the reason why I think God set it up in such a way that none of us would volunteer or think that God has appointed us to determine and to decide and to declare to people what part of the Bible to throw out and what part to keep. What commands are relevant for us today and what are no longer relevant? Those passages that so many times we have surrendered and succumbed to liberalism. Especially 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And to think that Paul was talking to rebellious women at Corinth. And the command there has nothing to do with us at all. That's not the nature of truth. Nor is it our task to decide what is cultural, what is spiritual, and what is eternal. Thy word is truth. To tamper with it is an attempt to tamper with truth. To discard of any of it is to destroy the truth of scripture. There is a consistency in it. And many of us, especially among us as brethren, we are seriously Christological. That's one thing we try to get straight is a person's view. What do you think of Christ? We don't tamper with the person, the essence of the Lord Jesus Christ and his identity. And one of the reasons why we do that is because the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You tamper with Christ, you tamper with truth. 
You tamper with truth. You tamper with the Lord Jesus Christ. You remove certain things about his nature and about his work, and you remove certain truths from scripture. You remove certain truths from scripture, and you remove certain things about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's about truth, and truth is about him. We have seen that in the scripture. All the truths in scripture are Christological from Genesis 1 to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. It has to do with the person of Christ. And so we have to be careful how we handle these truths as they are revealed to us in scripture. So thy word is true. Not thy word contains truth. Making this a, a, a very difficult task then for us to find out those a part of it that are actually true and the other part that need to be discarded. Again, be diligent. Present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a standard of measurement. The little toddler growing up and soon, soon become convinced that she is as tall as her mother and declare one day and said, mommy, mommy, I am five feet tall. The mother chuckled and said, how did you arrive at that? Here is my measuring stick. Well, how, how long is that? This is actually five feet, mommy. The child determines and decides the measuring standard. If we're not careful as brethren, we reduce our assemblies to the toddler mentality. That it, we decide what truth is. We decide the me measurement. We decide the commands in scripture to obey. Now that is, how did we get into this corner? When since we have cut our anchor from the biblical truths as handed to us by our founding fathers, and we have taken up the invitation that we can discard, we can invite others to come and to decide whether we are in it and whether we are against it. That we can decide whether or not the, the sisters in, in corporate worship are to cover their heads. We can bring that and we determine that, we decide that. So scripture is no longer our final standard. We're treating scripture like the baker who is handling a dough. Mix it and then shape it and decide how they're going to produce it. We don't have that luxury. We don't surrender to the heat of society, our poles, our demand. Truth is fixed, it's eternally settled in heaven. And we are to adhere and we have to surrender to the truths of God's word. What is the source of truth? That, that should help us a little bit. Well, we understand this, that God is the source of truth. It's not the philosophers. It's not even the Bible writers. They are not the source. We're going to see that in a moment. That they didn't determine and decide what to write. Peter is going to address that. God is the source of biblical truth. Listen to Peter, 2 Peter 2, 20, 2 Peter 1, 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Prophecy, biblical truth did not come by the will of man. It's not that you remember in school very early, primary school perhaps, one of the essays or composition that we had to write very early. What is it you want to be when you grow up? Not many of us remember that, and it's a good thing too as well. But the fact of the matter is that the Bible did not come about where the writers sit under an oak tree and decide to write on a particular subject, or to write about a person, or write about an event. And if that were true, where would prophecy come in? Because they have no access to tomorrow. They have no access to the future. So it has to be someone who is sovereign, someone who has a plan, someone who has the power to execute that plan with only successful opposition. And that's how we get prophecy. It's about God announcing beforehand what he plans to do. And he's going to bring it to pass. Well, that didn't come about with man's creativity and volition. 
and your interest in literature? He said, you know what? Isaiah said, I'm going to write something about God and Israel. Nobody has written that. No. Peter said, but contrast, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I challenge you then to just to leave it hanging there that Corinthians was penned by the Apostle Paul and that's all about it. No. According to what we have in here in the Word of God and other places that he was under con con control of the Holy Spirit. They were moved by the Spirit of God. God not only moved the hands of the writers, but their mind. He superintended. He put in their mind what he wanted them to put on the paper. And so God, God directed, God revealed his word. The source of truth is God. You see why, why, how dangerous it is then to tamper with biblical revealed truth? And to think that your arrival, your exit from the womb and before your entrance into the tomb, we think that somehow we have to help God fix truth. I think most of us here would agree and observe already that truth is older than we are. Truth is older than our fathers. Truth is older than our forefathers. Truth is older than Adam. Truth is older than creation. Truth is linked to the transcendence of God. God's existence outside of the created universe. And truth flows from him. We can't alter that which is unalterable. We can't change that which is unchangeable. Change and decay in all around we see. But all oh, thou who changes not, abide with me. That's our anchor. It is not up for grabs or for modification or for modernization. Truth is fixed in its eternal perspective. Things will come and go, wear and tear. Things will become obsolete and of no use. But I want you to observe this, not the word of God. It is settled in heaven forever. By faith, Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, the invisible existed before the visible. The visible comes out of the invisible. Let there be light. What's the source? The sun? The moon? The luminaries in the sky? No, God is the source of light. He, in fact, he is light. And so we understand then that it is by faith we understand. Without determining truth on the basis of our comprehension. We don't ex recognize biblical truth because it fits into the mental terrain of our minds. We don't recognize biblical truth because it agrees with our philosophy and with our mindset. And our understanding. It's the other way around. It is by faith. It's not by understanding. It is not by agreement. It is by faith. Moses only heard about how God created the universe because somebody who was there told him what happened. Moses believed it and he was commanded to write it. He wrote it. Now we get it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we believe by faith we accept that, the word of God. Well, this, there's nothing unique about Genesis 1.1. We have to accept it by faith. There's nothing unique about 1 Corinthians 11 either. About the covering of the female and the uncovering of the male. It is saying by faith, God spoke. The God who is eternal. There's no invitation for us to access some other source. So Moses said... In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. And so, so to examine that, to scrutinize that, to see if it's factual, then we decide to interview some of God's classmates. Do you know anybody who went to school with him? Do you know anyone who shared class with him on graduation day? Do you know any teacher who stood proud on graduation day and said, that was my best student? Do you know anybody who taught God and anybody who has ever been his counselor? Isaiah, the prophet, asked the question, to whom then would you liken him? Who has been his counselor? Who taught him knowledge? 
Who taught him the path to hang the heavens and the sky without any foundation? Who taught him that? Who was his favorite teacher? And by the way, do you know anybody who went to school with Adam? Truth is quite different from all the other disciplines and subject matters that we have learned. When it comes to biblical truth, it's quite different. It's provided by God and God alone. And notice here is that we understand that the world, the word world is in the plural. It's not just referring to the earth, but, but to other planets too as well. That God started as the transcendent person, the only independent person who exists outside of creation. We talk about the transcendence of God. The invisible God. God is spirit. Second Timothy, we come to the cooks of the matter now. Second Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How the liberals would love to see the word some replacing the word all. They would love to do it. In fact, they have tried with the word that is translated here as all. They have tried to make it just scripture. They have even used a very subtle synonym, every scripture. And that, of course, Cause it to hang out there in a no man's land. Not the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. That is instruction or teaching. We teach the basics on the basis of the Christian faith. The Bible says it's flowing from that. Everything comes to terms of by revelation. How would we know about sin and its nature and its entrance? How would we know about God's solution to the sin virus? Except that the Bible, God reveals that to us. Instruction, doctrine, teachings, that which formulate what we believe. And how we need to revisit that. We need to declare ourselves. We need to get back to the... the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We perhaps need to teach these to our Sunday school kids and get back to the affirmation of biblical revealed truth that is on a level and a category all by itself. It's profitable for doctrine and for reproof. It can stand up to criticism, censor, or rebuke. Nobody, especially a servant, a teacher, a preacher of the word of God is beyond reproof. None. The measurement and the standard exist outside of the messenger, the communicator. We don't determine truth, we declare it. John says that which we declare unto you, that which we receive. They don't tamper with it. A faithful messenger does not tamper with the message that he's given to deliver. That's where we stand as brethren. That's where we need to give our affirmation. And if we have changed our minds individually about that, we need to make the declaration to others that we no longer believe that we can be corrected by the scripture. We need to let others know that we have arrived. We have arrived, arrived on a flight that is above everybody else in altitude. And therefore, we are not subject to criticism. Not true at all. If you're going to declare the word of God, we must be held accountable to the standard that we declare. Biblical truth is not a dough, not a piece of dough that we squeeze into that which we like or what society or what the current time would influence to do that. We didn't get that from our forefathers. We don't have that practice. We don't need to have such introduction to revise, review, and to renew. We don't need to do that. Truth produces renewal. Truth produces renovation of the heart. It doesn't invite us to tamper with its nature. 
reproof. Yes, we are to be criticized. Yes, we are to be censored. Yes, we are to be held accountable. The truth is too important and too old for us to think that somehow it ends when we came out of the womb. We must be held as brethren, brothers and sisters, as ministers of the gospel. We are stewards. We must be held accountable to the biblical truth that we handle and declare. It's profitable for correction. It's measuring up to standard of truth. That's how you correct. First, we're criticized. De My dear brother, did I hear you say that? My dear brother, could you just explain to me a little bit what that means with some clarity? I'm having a little bit problem fitting it into the rest of the body of truth. That's a part of your responsibility. You ought to be bereaved. Nobody is to be beyond that scrutiny and, and criticism. And when we as brothers, our sisters, when we as messengers of the truth, and when we are criticized and the truth is brought to bear to what we present and what we believe, we are to yield to correction. It's a major pitfall. It's a shipwreck of our person and our ministry when we think that we are above correction. We must surrender to biblical truth, the authority of biblical truth. No matter how we present it in an articulate, persuasive, and a convincing manner, all those are methodologies. They have nothing to do with the message. The veracity of truth stands independent of the messenger. We do have people across the world who are very articulate, very persuasive. Some of them in politics, but we do have some of them in, in, in religion too as well. Very persuasive. They could pocket, package garbage in such a way and taste better than any, any candy or anything else that you delight in. Yes, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. How should we then live? One of the things that we can't and we should not do, whether we know family or in school or in church, when we are administering correction, we remove error. But if we don't replace it with truth, then it's not properly corrected. Error must be replaced with truth. And this truth must be instruction in righteousness. You notice how many of the verses I read from the Old Testament not only carry the word truth, but also righteousness. Because truth impacts. Truth has an independent power all of its own. Doesn't need our articulation. Doesn't need our psychological methodologies. None of that. It's independent. Instruction, training, and discipline of the total man, body, soul, and spirit. Paul says to the Thessalonians, I want when the Lord appears to find you blameless, body, soul, and spirit. And so truth impacts the total man. It's not just for when you go to church, but it has to do with everything about us that we have to realize the nature of truth. Truth doesn't stand at your mercy. Truth doesn't stand at, at the door of your persuasion and waiting for your entrance. Truth is waiting for you to let the light in, and it impacts us, transforms us, and bring us into proper alignment with God. I like how Dr. Warren Risby, how he explains this passage there in Timothy. I love it. First time I saw it, I said, this is good. It's something we could use. And listen to what he says. They are profitable for doctrine what is right they are profitable for reproof what's not right they are profitable for correction how to get it right and then he says for instruction in righteousness how to stay right i love it i hope you love it too what is right what is not right how to get it right and how to stay right by daily living and instruction, because truth impacts. Truth is not just a, a mental principle. 
that enters the mind. No, truth is potent. It impacts the whole man, not just your thinking. Jesus said, happy are you if you know these things and do them. It's one thing to be humpted dumpies. It's one thing to boast about the knowledge we have. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. About knowing. But it doesn't make any sense if we know and we don't show. It doesn't make sense if we possess the light of truth. We know, but we don't glow. Resident truth makes its way out into the members of our bodies and the conduct and the way of life. Not just what we believe, but how we behave. That's the uncompromising nature of truth. And then these are the truths that has given us basically the columns of Christian theology. Indeed, what we might call in theological institutions, systematic theology. And how we need to get our people thinking more biblically. Thank God for those who have worked assiduously in the history of the church to help us formulate and put together, to systematize and to gather the various information verses from different parts of the bible into manageable into a systematized gathering of relevant information so we talk about theology the verses of better yet theology proper all the verses in the bible the passages that address the nature of the attribute of god as revealed this is not the gathering of philosophical thinking this is not the invitation to tell us what you think about God. That's not what I am talking about. That's not what our founding fathers handed to us. It's what the Bible says about God, theology proper, and how we need to think in a structured biblical way, bibliology. We're currently doing a study at our church here in Fresh Meadows, Hillcrest Gospel Chapel, how we got our Bibles. It's important that we remember that the Bible is the word of God. This is the final authority. We don't turn to any other source. God has given us this as a tremendous gift and how we need to present it to members of our congregation. Not just those of us who are privileged to get information and training in, in theological institutions. You know, I've always believed this, and I say this passionately. We need to bring back the word of God to the classroom of the church. To the local church. We need to wrestle the word of God out of theological institution only and make the classroom, the church, the classroom to teach the word of God. It's my prayer and hope that there will be a revival among us as brethren. That has been our heritage to bring back those tools and to have every believer thinking biblically and the contents, what the Bible has to say about angels, not what society. And with the advent of social media and the blending of religions of the world and philosophies, we succumb to that which appealed to our own nature. It fits into the terrain of our mind, speculative theology about angels, things within our culture, all why fables about angels. We need to remove those and replace them with the biblical doctrine and teaching of angels, angelology, demonology. What the Bible says about demons. We need to be biblically informed on all these. Anthropology, the biblical study of mankind. What does the Bible have to say about mankind? With our children going to college and universities now, it used to be a small group of our generation that would ever make it to college and university. Today, majority is going there. And you have secular anthropology. It's time we hear what our maker has to say about who, who we are. How he made us. What went wrong. And how to get it right. Homotheology. The biblical study of sin. Sin is the only. The first and the only virus that man has. All the other so-called viruses, they are symptoms. There's one virus we have. Why do you think heaven dispatched? the Lord Jesus Christ to shed his blood as the only vaccine 
Why you think the Bible presents faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in his shed blood as man's only solution? Why? Because there's only one virus we have. It's called sin. We know more about almost everything else that affects our behavior than we know about what the Bible says about this vaccine, about this particular virus. And if we don't get the virus right, we're going to apply the wrong vaccine. And that's what's happening in, in, in denominations and in the religions of the world. Their diagnosis is marred with error. We need a biblical diagnosis based on the truths of God's word, the uncompromising truth. And if we get the diagnosis right and we get the prognosis according to the scripture, then we'll be able to apply the prescription. That's what we need, biblical truth. The Bible has that biblical diagnosis. It has the prognosis and it also has the prescription. Hamadiology, Christology, no getting around this. The Lord Jesus Christ with the disciples on the road to the Emmaus, rather, spoke to the disciples about the things in the scriptures concerning himself, beginning at Moses. Not the person of Moses, but the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. Sometimes you refer to a portion of the scripture by the author. And so when Jesus said they have Moses and the prophets, he's referring to the Pentateuch, the Torah. And he started at Genesis. How, I don't know, you must agree with me on this. You don't have any choice. How we wish we were part of that Bible study. To see Jesus walk those disciples through those unpronounceable names in the Old Testament and show himself. And all those passages that seem so dry and deserted. To see Jesus light up the Old Testament history. Chronicles and show them the things concerning himself. What a Bible study <laughs> when the Son of God, the personification of the truth, shows and clarifies truth, soteriology, God's vaccine to sin, the study of salvation, pneumatology, a study of the person and work of God, the Holy Spirit. All these come from biblical truths. And men and women have worked hard to put these things together. Let's bring them back to the, the, the local assembly. Ecclesiology, the biblical study of the doctrine of the church, what the Bible has to say about the church, and eschatology, the study of last things. We should not expose our believers or lead them to the speculation of men and other religions when we have biblical truth. We have a sure word of prophecy. How we need to come back, commit ourselves to teaching. It's the word of God. And finally, as we wrap this up, we are told about Paul instructing the Ephesians in dealing with spiritual warfare. The sword of the spirit. Did you notice that he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Wow. And yet, most of us want to remove the sharp nets of the edge. We want to dull the edge of the sword. The sword is the word of God. Saints, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to. And yet, we want it to become corrosive. We want to remove certain things from it. That's not what the, that's the sword. And notice that the word is the sword. I love it because of something that I've observed. The sword of the spirit. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The uncompromising truth within the pages of God's word. Not an invitation for us to determine and decide what we're going to get rid of and what we're going to accept. Truth doesn't lend itself to that type of reproduction or repackaging. Truth will not yield. As you have heard the story, that's why we have the phrase, 
the naked truth. It will not be covered with fig leaves. It will not be covered by attempts to tamper with that which only God knows and what he has revealed in his word. I'm inviting us as our assemblies across the globe. We have to agree. The assemblies are going through turbulent times, difficult times. Or what we need to stabilize as we see God as the way we go and what we do next. First, we need to do, find the anchor. Make sure that our anchor is truth. Not the articulation of men, not the messengers and the servants who handle the word. But make sure that we are anchored to the naked truth of God's word. And that all of us are under its sway and power and authority. And that no matter how eloquent and persuasive, no matter how you like a particular Bible teacher, you must love the truth, which is your anchor above anybody. We must commit ourselves to biblical truth. We want to thank those who have influenced us over the years, our Sunday school teachers. Many of them are in glory now, at least many of mine. Some are still around. We thank God for men who have poured out their lives and their resources. So we, I know for me, I am better. I am what I am because of my Sunday school teachers, my youth leaders. And I'm still remembering, I have to mention his name. Oh, dear brother Clyde Edwards. I mentioned to him many times the story I heard as a kid in Sunday school. Can't even remember how old I was then. But I still can retell that story he told about the feeding of the 5,000. Word for word. It's happy to see that ministry still going on on YouTube. And it's a good idea to expose the next generation. Yes, we were taught and trained by giants of the faith by men and women who are anchored to the truth. Perilous time will come, the Bible says. Men will develop itching ears, and people will disregard truth. But remember this, in a storm, in a turbulent times, your hope is not so much for calmness. Find your anchor. And once you find the anchor, we can say, my anchor holds, our anchor holds, for Jesus' sake. Father, it is with grateful hearts we bow in your presence. We are truly grateful for what you have said to us over this weekend. At a time when we remember that invaluable work, that surrender to the hands of wicked men so that your son could be executed and that we could say, Jesus died an atoning death. But we thank you that on this after Sunday, we are here after the fact, he's alive. And we rejoice in that truth that no one can take from us. That Jesus Christ is not only alive, but he ascended and you exalted him. He's at your right hand. We wait for him. We say with the apostle John, even so, come Lord Jesus for his name's sake. Amen. Saints, we bless God for his word today. And I pray that as we meditate on what God has said to us, we make sure that we place Jesus at the center of our lives. Indeed, he is the anchor on which we rest as believers and we center everything in our God. Sing with us this final song. Jesus at the center of it all. Let's sing. Jesus at the center of it all. Sing. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning. From beginning to the end. It will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Sing again. Jesus, sing. Jesus at the center of it all. 
Jesus at the center of it all. Beginning to, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always Hallelujah. been you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's Jesus. Jesus. Nothing else. Nothing else.